Subcommittee on National Security would come to order without objection. The chair is recessed. The chair is authorized to declare recess at any time. We're here today to continue this committee's oversight into U.S. policy towards the Cuban dictatorship. Almost six months ago, I held a field hearing in Miami to examine the Obama administration's failures with regard to Cuba policy. Today, we're joined by our fellow citizens who are acutely aware of the failures of that policy. Armando Alejandre, Jr., Pablo Morales, Mario de la Pena, and Carlos Casta. These are the names of the four men killed in a savage attack by the Castro regime on February 24th, 1996. It is my hope that our Department of Justice will indict Raul Castro and others responsible for this barbarous act. Armando, Pablo, Mario, and Carlos were flying on a humanitarian mission to help desperate men, women, and children fleeing the oppressive Castro regime and makeshift rafts. They were warriors on the front lines of freedom, doing their part in the struggle against the evil, totalitarian Cuban government. These brave men, flying unarmed, were shot down over international waters by Cuban MiGs, a heinous crime that defies comprehension, except we're talking about the Castros. These two gangsters took pleasure in human rights abuses and spreading chaos throughout the region. Unfortunately, our government has failed to hold Cuba's leaders accountable. In fact, under the Obama administration, the United States released the men convicted for their role in connection with the 1996 attack. One man in particular, Gerardo Hernandez, had his wish come true by the Obama administration, which supported Hernandez in his quest to impregnate his wife with artificial insemination. It'd be laughable if it weren't so true, but our government helped the convicted terrorist get his wife pregnant while he sat in federal prison. To top it off, Hernandez was then released back to Cuba, where he received a hero's welcome. It is sickening, and it was and is a disgrace. We're also here today to talk about what the Trump administration has done with regards to Cuba and what it can do in the future, because we can do more. We must indict criminals like Raul Castro. We can indict uh, them and place economic sanctions on other senior officials of the Cuban government. We can get back the fugitives and cop killers like Joanne Chesimard. However, I'm deeply concerned that the bureaucracy and the State Department uh, is purposely disregarding and undermining President Trump's Cuba policies. We may be seeing the final gasp of the holdovers attempting to continue down the failed policy course. The President, in his speech in Little Havana last June, made it clear, quote, we will not lift sanctions on the Cuban regime until all political prisoners are freed, freedoms of assembly and expression are respected, all political parties are legalized, and free and internationally supervised elections are scheduled, end quote. I'll make sure to follow up with the President, the Secretary of State, and the National Security Council to ensure that all these things happen. This committee will continue to pursue the corrupt bureaucrats who obstruct and enable this regime. We owe it to men like Armando, Pablo, Mario, and Carlos. We owe it to their loved ones. We owe it to those in Cuba who live this nightmare every day. It is my honor and privilege to have the family members of the men murdered on that day in February 1996 here today uh, as a reminder that the fight for justice continues. We won't forget and we'll continue the fight. Today with us testifying about, the, about the, that fight is Miriam de la Pena. Miriam is the mother of Mario and we are so honored to have you here to testify. We're also grateful that your husband Mario is here as well. Thank you and God bless. We're also blessed to have Anna Alejandre Ciresco. Now, how did I say that right? Anna is the sister of Armando, and again, we are very honored to have you here today, and I thank you for coming. We also have Mr. Jason Poblete, a national security and federal regulatory lawyer in private practice who is an expert in Cuba policy issues and can help us understand what we can do right now to take action against Cuba's leaders. Uh, next is Ambassador Roger Noriega who is caught in traffic and also served as Assistant Secretary of State for Western Hemisphere Affairs in the Bush administration. Before that, he was, permanent US, he was the U.S. Permanent Representative to OIS, the Organization of American States, and he can provide more details about what the regime is doing around the region uh, and throughout the world. 
Finally, we have William Leo Grande, Professor of Government and Dean of the American University School of Public Affairs. We appreciate you being here. Thank you so much for being here, uh, all of you. We look forward to your testimony. And with that, I would like to recognize the ranking member of the committee, Mr. Lynch, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I'd like to thank you for holding this hearing to examine the state of human rights in Cuba. I'd also like to thank today's witnesses for your willingness to, for helping the committee with its work. Uh, let me begin by expressing my sincere sorrow to the families of the four U.S. crew members whose civilian aircraft was shot down in 1996 by Cuban fighter jets during a humanitarian service mission with Brothers to the Rescue. Ms. R Miriam de la Pena, the mother of U.S. pilot uh, Mario de la Pena, and Ms. Ana Alejandra Ceresco, the sister of U.S. pilot Armando Alejandra, are here with us today, and I thank you both for your willingness and strength in offering this subcommittee your important perspectives on human rights accountability in Cuba. It is clear that the Republic of Cuba remains an authoritarian state whose citizens are subjected to the widespread abuse of human rights by their government. Over the past decade alone, the U.S. State Department has consistently reported serious human rights violations that include the use of threats, physical assault, detentions, and intimidation by the government as a means of limiting the freedom of expression and peaceful assembly and silencing political opposition. Cuban authorities have also routinely engaged in the monitoring or, or private of, of private communications and limitations on freedom of the press, as underscored by the State Department. The free exercise of these and other civil liberties is prohibited in the Cuban Constitution when contrary to, quote, the existence and objectives of the socialist state, close quote. Moreover, the government has sought to prevent workers from forming independent trade unions and placing stringent, stringent restrictions on workers' rights. According to the State Department, the majority of human rights abuses have been committed at the direction of the Cuban government with impunity. This year witnessed the transition to a new government in Cuba with the resignation of President Raul Castro and selection of the Cuban National Assembly of Vice President Miguel Diaz Canel uh, to succeed him as president. While President Castro will remain as leader of the Cuban Communist Party throughout 2021, the inauguration of President Diaz Canel marked the first time since the 1959 Cuban Revolution that a Castro is not leading the government. In the midst of this political transition, it's imperative that we continue to address the Cuban government's repression of human rights by building upon the renewed U.S. engagement with Cuba that began during the Obama administration and which has left, been left largely intact under President Trump. We must further develop a U.S.-Cuba policy that underscores and reflects our longstanding commitment to the advancement and protection of international and universal human rights. This must include the continuation of the bilateral human rights dialogue with Cuban, offic Cuban officials that began in 2015, as well as meaningful funding for efforts undertaken by the U.S. Agency for International Development, State Department, and other agencies to support human rights and the development of a democratic and civil society in Cuba. While President Trump proposed zeroing out funding for human democracy programs for fiscal year 2018, the bipartisan omnibus appropriations bill supported by Congress in March ultimately provided $20 million in funding the same as in fiscal year 2017. Our Cuba policy going forward must also work to ensure the safety of U U.S. diplomatic personnel deployed on the island. In the aftermath of the still unexplained injuries suffered by at least 24 employees at the U.S. Embassy in Havana in November of 2016, the State Department ordered the departure of all non-emergency non embassy personnel and their families to mitigate their exposure to, quote, attacks of an unknown nature, close quote. However, in March of this year, the State Department announced a permanent staffing plan at U.S. Embassy Havana under which the mission will now operate with the minimum personnel necessary to perform core diplomatic and consular functions. We must make every effort to keep these personnel safe. Mr. Chairman, I look forward to the discussions of these issues and other important issues relating to Cuba, uh, U.S.-Cuba relations with today's witnesses. I yield back the balance of my time. Gentleman yields back. Um, I will now recognize uh, 
uh, the gentlewoman from Florida, who's no uh, stranger uh, to this issue and other issues involving fighting for human rights, uh, Ms. Ross Layton, for an opening statement. Thank you so much, Chairman DeSantis and Ranking Member uh, Lynch. Thank you for convening this uh, important hearing, uh, for allowing me to join you uh, for the second time this year as we debate U.S. policy toward my native homeland of Cuba. I'd like to thank our witnesses uh, today, all familiar faces, uh, Jason and Roger, thank you for being with us today. Always good to see you again. Anna and Miriam, thank you for not giving up on your efforts to seek justice for Armando and for Mario. You two represent a united voice of the surviving families of these Brothers to the Rescue pilots who want nothing more than to hold accountable the Cuban regime officials responsible for the murder of these innocent, brave men. It's been 22 years uh, since that fateful Saturday when three U.S. citizens and one U.S. permanent resident, all innocent, unarmed civilians, were brutally killed by the Castro regime uh, for simply trying to aid Cubans uh, escaping Castro's illegal grip on power. Carlos Costa, Mario de la Peña, Armando Alejandre, Pablo Morales were heroes in the eyes of the American people and to the Cuban people. 22 years later, how has the United States, their country, honored the memories of these uh, brave patriots? Well, Ruben Martinez uh, Puente, Lorenzo Alberto Perez y Perez, and Francisco Perez y Perez, all Cuban regime operatives, have been indicted in our U.S. courts uh, for their roles in the murderous Brothers to the Rescue shootdown. But until this day, sadly, they have yet to be held accountable. I have urged administration after administration to bring these perpetrators to the United States so that they can be persecuted, uh, prosecuted in accordance with our laws, and justice for this criminal act can be served. But accountability doesn't just stop with them. This was an orchestrated attack. And as we know, nothing happens in Cuba without being sanctioned by the Castro regime. Regime. And that means Raul Castro himself, which is why I urge our U.S. administration and our courts to go after Raul Castro for his role in the murderous act. The Department of Justice and the Department of State can and must indict Raul Castro and all others involved in the shootdown. Yet each administration since the attack has not moved one inch to hold them responsible. Uh, in, instead, in its pursuit of normalizing relations uh, with the island, the Obama administration made the monumental error of releasing Cuban spy Gerardo Hernandez, and you have uh, pointed it out, who was convicted of conspiracy to commit espionage and conspiracy to commit murder for his role in the murder of these brave pilots. Mr. Chairman, in a previous hearing, we're so happy that you held in our uh, hometown of Miami, uh, we have already discussed the negative implications of the misguided Cuba policy of the Obama administration, giving concession after concession to a murderous regime in exchange for nada, zip, zilch, nothing. And to this day, that same regime, for it does not matter who leads it, whether it's Castro or Diaz-Canel, that same regime that violated international airspace in order to kill Carlos, Mario, Armando, and Pablo, it remains as repressive as ever, routinely beating, harassing, detaining peaceful protesters and journalists. Even as President Obama was visiting the island, the human rights abuses remain unchanged, and as our very own uh, State Department's uh, latest human rights report on Cuba points out, there are many, many, many political prisoners in Cuba today. I laud uh, Ambassador Nikki Haley in her announcement yesterday to withdraw the United States from the UN Rights Council. Having Cuba serve in the Council is a mockery to the mission of that institution, an insult to the Cuban people who day after day are denied their most basic human rights. This administration has taken concrete positive steps to reverse President Obama's wrong-headed Cuba policy by uh, clamping down on economic lifelines to the oppressors and their hand-picked military leaders. However, it can and must do more so that there's no question that this administration truly supports the Cuban people and our cherished ideals and values and not of seeking rapprochement with a dictatorial regime. So I look forward to the witnesses today. I thank you for your leadership, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I want to hear about their recommendations to Congress and to the administration 
to the brothers, to the rescue um, pilots, their families. They will forever, you will forever be an inspiration uh, to those who are willing to endure great sacrifices for the sake of a free Cuba. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Ranking Member. I'm honored that you have uh, allowed me to participate. Thank you. I thank the gentlewoman, and I'm pleased to introduce our witnesses. We do have, as was mentioned, uh, Ms. Miriam de la Pena, who's the mother of Brothers to the Rescue pilot, Mario de la Pena. Welcome. We have Ms. Anna Alejandre Ciresco, sister of Brother to the Rescue pilot, Armando Alejandre Jr. Welcome. We have Mr. Jason Poblete, attorney at Poblete Tamargo LLP. Welcome to you. Ambassador Roger Noriega, who's now at the American Enterprise Institute. Glad you got made it through the traffic. It was really bad today because I came in about an hour ago and it was a long, long trip just from the airport. Um, and then Dr. William Leo Grand, Associate Vice Pres Provost for Academic Affairs uh, for the Department of Government at American University School of Public Affairs. Welcome and welcome to you all. Pursuant to community rules, all witnesses will be sworn in before they testify. So if you can please rise and raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony you're about to give is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? Please be seated. All witnesses answered in the affirmative. In order to allow time for discussion, please limit your testimony to five minutes. Your entire written statement will be made a part of the record. And as a reminder, the clock in front of you shows your remaining time. The light will turn yellow when you have 30 seconds left and red when your time is up. Please also remember to press the button to turn your microphone on before speaking and to speak into the microphone. Uh, and right now, I'd like to uh, recognize Ms. De La Pena for five minutes. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Good afternoon, members of the committee. I'm Miriam De La Pena, and I'm here because of the four innocent men from my district of South Florida who were murdered, namely Armando Alejandre Jr., Carlos Costa, Pablo Morales, and my own son, Mario De La Pena. Their killers are known, but sadly, they remain at large. Madeleine Albright, Ambassador Madeleine Albright at the UN General Assembly on March 6, 1996, shortly after the shootdown, described it this way, and I quote, the fact is that on February 24, 1996, the Cuban military knowingly, willingly, and in broad daylight, shot down two aircraft that were unarmed and clearly marked as civilian. As Cuban officials were well aware, these aircraft posed no threat to the Cuban people or government. The aircraft were interna in international airspace and they were destroyed intentionally and in clear violation of international law." Close quote. The condemnation was echoed by well-known national and international organizations such as the European Union, the UN Commission of Human Rights, and its counterpart at the Organization of American States the UN Security Council, the United States Congress, the International Civil Aviation Organization, and my own district, the US Southern District Court of Florida. Just to cite a few from the reports above, ICAO reaffirmed its condemnation of the use of weapons against civil aircraft in flight as being incompatible with elementary considerations of humanity and the UN Commission on Human Rights in Geneva, Switzerland reported also in 1996, and I quote, the shootdown was a premeditated act and that it constituted a violation of the right of life to four people, close quote. The evidence supporting the crime committed against three Americans and a legal resident is overwhelming. It was the shootdown that prompted President Clinton to sign into law the Cuban Liberty and Democratic Solidarity Act of 1996. It is also the reason why the law cites the findings by the US Congress condemning the shootdown as an act of terrorism by the Castro regime. Congress also urged the president back then to seek in the International Court of Justice indictments for this act of terrorism by Fidel Castro, I close quote. We could also note that in, that in it, 
Congress reaffirmed the fact that it is incumbent upon the U.S. government to protect the lives and livelihood of U.S. citizens, as well as the rights of free passage and humanitarian missions. With so much evidence at hand for a crime defined, and I quote the above entities, as a barbaric violation of international law, an extrajudicial killing premeditated and intentional, using brutal methods and tantamount to cold blooded murder, among others. Isn't it inconceivable that the criminals have gotten away with the murders for, of four innocent men in the past 20, for the past 22 years? Perhaps declassifying additional information will aid in the pursuit of justice. Or must we die and never see justice served? I beg those of you in government responsible for our safety and that of our children to do what is necessary to procure justice and put an end to impunity. Adding fuel to the fire, the families were deeply hurt when Gerardo Hernandez, the only Cuban high-ranking military official serving a life sentence in the U.S. for his role in the shootdown, was released from prison. We felt back then, as we feel now, betrayed when this communist cadre of the Cuban military apparatus was set free and returned to Cuba. Justice was aborted by a stroke of President Obama's pen. Should a U.S. president defend and respect the rights of American citizens, or should he favor their victimizers? Finally, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, it is my hope that the systematic human right abuses taking place in Cuba will soon come to an end and that our president will be the first president in nearly six decades to shake the hand of a Cuban president freely elected by the people who respects and defends the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. I thank the committee for the opportunity granted me on behalf of our loved ones, Armando, Pablo, Carlos, and Mario. God bless the United States of America. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Chiresco, you're up for five minutes. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman and committee members. Thank you for having this hearing today. My brother, Armando Alejandre, a Marine and Vietnam veteran, was murdered by the Cuban government on February 24, 1996, together with Carlos Costa, Mario Manuel de la Peña, and Pablo Morales. I am here representing Armando's widow, daughter, sisters, 96-year-old mother, and many family members. 22 years after the shootdown, we're still searching for justice. We were dealt a very harsh blow when Gerardo Hernandez, convicted of conspiracy to murder in the shootdown, was returned to Cuba by President Obama. What I brought to you today is a compilation of evidence that supports the guilt of the many responsible for these murders, this information, reports, indictments, transcriptions of communications, audio tapes, etc., should bring us a little bit closer to justice. We provided most of this evidence to the FBI in 2002. In 2003, the U.S. District Court, Southern District of Florida, issued indictments charging the head of the Cuban Air Force, Ruben Martinez Puente, and the MiG pilots, the brothers Lorenzo Alberto and Francisco Perez Perez, with conspiracy to kill U.S. nationals, destruction of aircraft, and murder. These indictments mark the end of action by the U.S. government on these murders. We seek additional indictments against many others responsible for the shootdown. First on the list is Raul Castro, who at the time of the shootdown was the chief of the Cuban Armed Forces. Castro no longer enjoys protection as head of state. There is an audio recording of a radio interview in which Castro accepts responsibility for these murders. There is also testimony that the Cuban Air Force had practiced shooting down small planes days before February 24. Various members of the Cuban intelligence and armed forces at the time of the shootdown should also be brought to justice. These include Eduardo Delgado Rodriguez, Brigadier General of the Cuban Director of Intelligence. Emilio Palacios, pilot of the MiG-23, Ulises Rosales del Toro, chief of the FAR, and others. 
We're also looking for the political will on the part of our government to transmit to Interpol the names of the pilots and the general who gave the order, all of whom have pending indictments in U.S. courts. We need to make sure that they are apprehended and brought to trial. <clears throat> We're also requesting information on the role of Ana Belen Montes in the shootout. She is currently serving a 25-year sentence in a U.S. correctional facility after having pled guilty to charges of espionage on behalf of the Cuban government. Montes was the top Cuban analyst for the Defense Intelligence Agency and advised President Clinton on the response to the shootdown. We're also pursuing information on Rolando Sarraf Trujillo, who was exchanged by President Obama for Alan Gross at the same time as when the three of the five convicted spies of the WASP network were released. Mr. Sarraf was accused of being an agent of the CIA and served 20 years in a Cuban jail. He has never been made available to the media and nothing is known about his whereabouts. We believe he may have information on the shoot down and would like our government to make him available to us. To summarize, we are seeking indictments starting with Raul Castro. We are requesting that the names of those already indicted be provided to Interpol. We are pursuing additional information from the testimony of others in our search for the truth. We hope that you, this committee, understand that this is not a Cuban issue. Carlos and Mario were born in the United States. My brother Armando was an American citizen, a Marine and Vietnam veteran, and Pablito was a U.S. resident. As Americans, they deserve the justice that is their due. Thank you very much for this opportunity. Thank you. Mr. Poblete, you're up. Holocaust survival, survivor and Nobel laureate Eli Wiesel said, to forget the dead would be akin to killing them a second time. So thank you, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Ranking Member, and members of the committee for holding this important oversight hearing on justice for American victims of Cuban communism. Since the World War II Nuremberg Tribunals, international systems, national courts, and laws the world over have evolved so that today lawyers have better tools, albeit imperfect, to exact justice against violators of universally accepted fundamental freedoms. Chile's Pinochet, Yugoslavia's Milosevic, Peru's Fujimori, Panama's Noriega, Brazil's Lula da Silva, Rwanda's Neta Ganzwa, and many other former foreign government officials have come face to face with Lady Justice. These are not symbolic moves. Rather, they advance the cause of justice and the rule of law. These are fundamental building blocks of a civilized society. Yet, as American airline planes land in Cuban airports, Carnival and Norwegian ships dock at Cuban ports, and Marriott International manages four hotels with the Cuban military. American families harmed by Cuban officials are increasingly concerned that their cases have been forgotten. Murder, torture, forced disappearances, hostage taking, as well as property confiscations unparalleled in the history of the Western Hemisphere are some of the crimes that have been committed against American citizens. My message to these Cuban criminals, justice will be done America will be coming for you. The Brothers to the Rescue shootdown is a good example of justice delayed, a delay that has harmed the cause of justice throughout the Americas. It is an invitation to autocrats to target Americans, as has been the case recently in Venezuela and in Nicaragua. The United States must indict Raul Castro and co-conspirators under U.S. law for the Brothers to the Rescue murders. The United States and other responsible stakeholders must also redouble efforts to track, investigate, indict, any Cuban official for crimes against Americans. The concerns of Americans tortured in Vietnam by the Cubans, the brothers to the rescue families that are here with us, and the thousands of other Americans who were victims of Cuban communism, their opinions and their values are just as important as those of American Airlines, Marriott, Carnival, Norwegian, the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, and others who advocate engagement with Cuba. All Americans deserve equal access and treatment under the law. Cuba will never be China or Vietnam of the Americas. It is an island of 10 million people run by bad and corrupt central planners. 
It is not a paradise. It is a gulag. It is a Potemkin village. When Americans visit, they only see what the police state wants them to see. The Communist Party does not like Americans, free markets, private property, or the rule of law. Americans who they perceive as a threat, as Cuba has done since 1959, will be targeted. That is why it was extremely disconcerting, but not surprising, when I learned that the State Department was investigating via a statutorily required accountability review board the alleged attacks against Americans stationed at Post Havana. Justice for the victims of the Brothers to the Rescue shootdown is a linchpin case for other Americans seeking justice for a wide range of crimes committed by Cuban outlaws. U.S. attorneys need full access to all information. The declassification process should begin swiftly. The safety of Americans, I believe, depends on it. Interpol red notices should be issued for Cuba international outlaws for existing indictments. And if legally possible, the United States should rescind whatever was promised to Cuba in exchange for five Cuban spies released from U.S. federal prison. One of these criminals who was directly involved in the Brothers to the Rescue shootdown said upon his release, I will do it again if I have to. Removing Cuba from the state sponsors of terrorism list was a grave mistake and based on the public record, reckless. It undermined U.S. policy goals but also set back the cause of justice as, have, and as has failing to effectively enforce many other U.S. laws. For example, nine sections of the Libertad Act have been poorly implemented and parts of it mostly ignored by both Republican and Democratic administrations. It is not, as critics claim, however, an outdated law that does not work. Laws work when laws are enforced. President Donald Trump's 2017 reorientation of U.S. policy was an excellent development, decades overdue. Senior executive agency officials and presidential advisors should robustly execute President Trump's National Security Presidential Memo No. 5, one that puts, quote, national security and foreign policy interests first. Similarly, as the Congress seeks rigorous enforcement of the Global Magnitsky Act, CATSA sanctions, it should seek the same for statutes guiding policy toward a regime with American blood on its hands. Finally, Beyond the more than eight recommendations offered in my prepared remarks for the record, the Trump administration should seriously consider creating an interagency task force to track down international outlaws in the Americas. Access to the U.S. market is a privilege, not a right. International outlaws belong behind bars. They, and in some cases their family members, should never be allowed to vacation in America, or worse, freely move about our country as agents of a totalitarian police state. Thank the gentleman. Chair now recognizes the Ambassador Noriega for five minutes. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I have a written statement for the record. I apologize again for my tardiness. Uh, no disrespect to the committee and its members. Uh, thank you for the opportunity for, uh, uh, to testify before you uh, at this hearing to remind us all of the February 24, 1996 attack by the Castro regime, which took the lives of four innocent men who were patrolling international waters to locate and rescue Cuban brothers and sisters at peril in the sea. The Castros never faced justice for this crime, despite the late dictator's public omission uh, that the two brothers orchestrated this ambush and the use of lethal force. In retrospect, Mr. Chairman, we should have recognized this 1996 attack as dispositive proof of the illegitimacy of the terror state in Cuba. Indeed, this hearing is a welcome opportunity to recall uh, that the regime in Havana has never been confronted for its international crime spree, which began nearly 60 years ago, six, de six decades ago, and continues to this very day. From urging the preemptive nuclear strike against the United States in 1962, to organizing a terror campaign against Central Americans, to sharing anti-American intelligence with our enemies in Baghdad and Belgrade, the Castro regime is an implacable and tireless foe of the United States. Castro's ongoing criminal conspiracy on our doorstep, which has converted Venezuela into a platform for narcotics trafficking, money laundering, embezzlement, extortion, and political destabilization, demands an urgent and effective response. The Castro regime installed Nicolas Maduro as the leader in Venezuela, and the perfection of a dictatorship and the destruction of an oil-rich economy is Cuba's handiwork, which was being perpetrated brazenly at the same time that President Obama was heaping concessions on Havana. Uh, 
Cuban agents run an internal security apparatus in Venezuela that safeguards a narco state, which consists of dozens of senior officials, including the president himself and the former vice president, uh, who have been convicted or sanctioned by U.S. authorities for the invo their involvement in narco trafficking and support for terrorism. Indeed, Mr. Chairman, there is fresh evidence of the Castro clan's direct involvement in drug trafficking and terrorism in Venezuela. Last month, two active-duty Venezuelan military officers informed U.S. law enforcement regarding the direct involvement of Cuban military personnel in cocaine smuggling and support for Colombian terror camps deep into Venezuelan territory. Specifically, one of the reports implicates Raul Castro's son-in-law, Cuban General Luis Alberto Rodriguez Lopez Callejas, in the shipment of cocaine through the Venezuelan port of La Huayda. Another senior Venezuelan officer told U.S. authorities how Cuban officers ordered the local military to steer clear of Colombian narco guerrilla camps deep in Venezuelan territory, which are responsible for transiting cocaine to Caribbean ports bound for the United States and other markets. At long last, we should treat Castro regime officials as the international criminals that they are starting with his decision not to recognize their hand-picked pawn as the legitimate leader of Cuba. In other words, we should break diplomatic relations with Cuba. We should gather the evidence to publicly identify Cubans who are involved in narco-trafficking, human rights violations, and crimes, and indict them in U.S. courts. We should convince willing partners in the international community to join us in applying financial sanctions against these criminals, freezing their assets and blocking their access to global financial networks. In my view, U.S. policymakers should judge future policies in, toward Cuba and whether they increase the economic and political freedom of the Cuban people. For example, we should reinvigorate our high-profile solidarity with the Cuban dissidents, human rights activists, independent journalists and artists who have informed me personally that the U.S. Embassy in Havana basically abandoned them after the Obama opening to the Cuban regime. We should rally like-minded governments in Latin America and Eastern Europe uh, to engage the Cuban people, not the dictatorship. We should res restore funding for robust pro-democracy programs uh, in Cuba. The State Department should return Cuba to the list of terrorist sponsors uh, in light of the fact that the Castro regime sustains Colombian terror groups despite a peace process in that country. And we should demand accountability as the ranking member said, for acoustic attacks against two dozen uh, U.S. diplomats in Havana, which did personal uh, physical harm uh, to these individuals representing us overseas. There should be a top-to-bottom review of the U.S. Department of Treasury and Commerce licenses for commercial activities in Cuba to ensure that they are consistent with U.S. policy and public law. And we should restore restrictions on tourism travel uh, to Cuba and focus instead on genuine, uh, meaningful people-to-people -people contact uh, that will advance uh, the real contact between the people of the United States and Cuba. And finally, as uh, Jason Poblet has said, uh, we should enforce uh, Title IV and Title III of the Libertad Act uh, which, and, and send a warning to even American businesses that those that are trafficking uh, in uh, confiscated property uh, face accountability if the president decides at any time, which he could, uh, to, waive, to stop waiving that right of action. Those are a few ideas, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for, very much for your attention, and I welcome the opportunity to answer any questions. Thank you. Doctor, you're up. Five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, Mr. Ranking Member, other members of the committee. Thank you for inviting me to testify today. <clears throat> in deciding to engage with North Korea, President Trump recognized that sanctions alone had failed to halt North Korea's nuclear program, so he took a different approach. Time will tell if it works. I hope that it will. But the basic idea behind his approach is no different than the idea behind President Obama's opening to Cuba. After decades of using the stick of sanctions against an adversarial regime without much success, it made sense to try to advance U.S. interests through a policy of engagement. Whether your principal concern is human rights or compensation for nationalized U.S. property or the return of U.S. fugitives or Cuba's support for the failing regime in Venezuela, there is no chance of making progress on these issues with a policy of hostility <clears throat> that relies exclusively on sanctions, especially when no other country in the world observes those sanctions. Moreover, our current economic sanctions <clears throat> harm the living standards of ordinary Cubans, 
And that's why the last three popes, including John Paul II, who was no friend of communism, opposed the embargo. The idea of engaging with Cuba is not a new one. Every president since Dwight D. Eisenhower, including both Richard Nixon and Ronald Reagan, engaged in negotiations with Cuba because they realized there were some problems that could only be solved with Cuban cooperation. And that is even more true today when so many of the issues we face in the Western Hemisphere are transnational, issues like migration, environmental protection, human trafficking, and organized crime. Engagement with an adversary in order to advance US interests does not constitute a moral endorsement of that adversary's behavior. President Trump's meeting with Kim Jong-un was not an endorsement of North Korea's human rights record, nor was President Obama's opening to Cuba an endorsement of that regime's human rights record. Our current national defense strategy, approved by the President in December, identifies China and Russia as our principal adversaries in the world today. Both are authoritarian regimes with terrible human rights records, yet we engage with them every day on a variety of issues because doing so serves our national interest. There is no reason not to do the same with Cuba. Moreover, as we back away from engagement with Cuba, Russia and China are rushing to fill the, gap, the vacuum. With regard to seeking criminal indictments against Cuban officials for human rights abuses, even if there were legal grounds for securing these indictments, the accused could not be brought to trial because Cuban law prohibits the extradition of Cuban nationals. In 1982, four Cuban officials were indicted in Florida for narcotics trafficking, and the effect, the only effect of those indictments was to delay the establishment of counter-narcotics cooperation between the United States and Cuba until the 1990s. In 2003, as has been mentioned, the two Cuban pilots responsible for shooting down the Brothers to the Rescue planes were indicted in Florida, along with their commanding general, but that case has not progressed either. Pursuing human rights indictments today might be symbolically satisfying, but it would poison the atmosphere of bilateral relations and impede existing law enforcement cooperation. That would endanger our ability to secure the extradition of US nationals who have committed crimes here and then fled to Cuba and our ability to pursue the prosecution in Cuba of Cuban nationals for crimes committed in the United States. These are areas in which there has been significant and ongoing progress since 2014. In short, I believe that more has been gained and more can be gained through a policy of engagement and cooperation on issues of mutual interest than through a policy of unmitigated hostility and heightened sanctions, real or symbolic. <clears throat> I agree with former Secretary of Commerce Carlos Gutierrez when he argues that engagement is the best way to help a new generation of Cubans modernize their economy and their political system. Cuba today is going through a process of change, both in its leadership and in its economy. The old generation that founded the regime is leaving the political stage. Most are already gone. At the same time, Cuba is trying to move from a Soviet-style economic planning system to some version of market socialism like China and Vietnam. Economic reform is providing Cubans greater economic freedom, and if it succeeds, it could raise their standard of living significantly. U.S. policy ought to facilitate that change, not impede it. Ultimately, the people of Cuba will determine their nation's future and decide on issues of accountability. If the United States wants to have a positive influence on these developing changes, it has to engage, not sit on the sidelines. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Uh, Chair now recognizes himself uh, for five minutes. Um, Ms. De La Pena, you know, can you tell me a little bit about Mario and, and, and why was he involved with Brothers to the Rescue? Mario was involved with... Sorry. Yes, Mr. Chairman. Um, my son Mario wanted to be a pilot all his life. It was something that um, he just loved. And um, he started flying and learning about airplanes at a very early age. And uh, when he had all his licenses um, to fly, Brothers to the Rescue was already rescuing, and it was in the news, rescuing lots of um, rafters, Cuban rafters, who would otherwise perish at sea. And it was a very, um, very um, wonderful thing to do. I admired him for wanting to do that, volunteer his time. And so um, he volunteered and uh, he was accepted to fly with them. 
he was working, he was going to school and uh, he had a part-time job and in between he would fly whenever he got called to, um, for a mission and he would leave the house at seven in the morning, fly and come back and tell me the stories of what had happened. And the first time he flew, uh, no, not the first time he flew because he first flew as an observer but, um, and then later as a pilot. But um, the first time that he saw a young couple at sea just, um, it was a little spot, and um, they communicated via two-way radio, and um, the couple was younger than he was, and he was only like 22. And uh, he came back and he said, Mom, they, they were younger than I am, and they were at sea with sharks and the whole works. And um, he, he was just very excited about doing it. That's why he joined Brothers to the Rescue, because it was a, a fulfilling, very fulfilling experience for him. Um, Ms. Cheresco, what about um, what about Armando? What was he like, and why did he do it? Well, Armando came to the United States as a ten-year-old. We came in 1960 to escape Castro's communism, and uh, he always felt a love for Cuba, but he also felt a love for the United States. And Armando was the kind of person who always wanted to to help others. Uh, he truly believed that his service in Vietnam was going to help stop communism, uh, the spread of communism. He had not been able to stop it in Cuba. He was just a little kid when he left. But he believed that he could make an impact there. Um, afterwards, he, he stayed very active on many issues, both on Cuban issues, but also on issues in the United States. During the Gulf War, he provided a lot of support to the families of the men and women who went to fight in the Gulf War. There were groups in Miami that were supporting them, and he, he did a lot there. And so it, he was always active with that. He actually was not a member of Brothers to the Rescue. He was just someone who cared about what was going on. And he had flown only once before to the Bahamas, where there was a camp where many rafters had been taken to, uh, because they had not been able to reach U.S. shores, they had reached the Bahamas, and they had taken diapers and milk and, and food, and he, they were supposed to go back to the Bahamas that day, and he was very excited about that, but I think it was planned by the Cuban government to make sure that instead they were uh, on the Florida Straits looking for rafters because they were not allowed to land in the Bahamas because the Cuban government had a visit to the camp that day and they didn't want both groups there at the same time. Now, what would you, uh, you and then other families, the, the, the experience about how the U.S. government reacted to that, uh, this, and and have you been disappointed? Uh, how would you uh, express your uh, your feelings about the aftermath? Here we are, many years later. We felt that the Clinton administration had a very weak response because we thought they're killing Americans on international waters, and the only thing that came out of that was the Helmsburg and the Cuban Libertad uh, Act. Um, and it, it didn't feel like it was enough. Um, before that, we always believed that the United States would stand for its citizens anywhere in the world. I cherish my United States passport. I travel a lot. But I don't feel as comfortable today as I did many, many years ago when I really believed that the United States would come to bat for any American citizen wherever they got into trouble. Ms. De La Pena? I feel equally as disappointed in the response <coughs> because um, my son would say, I don't break the law, I am saving lives, and I'll be fine, Mom. I was worried about the weather and the clouds and the thundering when he was flying in these little planes. I was not worried about a Castro war plane coming out of their territory into international airspace and killing and shooting down the two planes without any notice to the pilots. Um, but it was very weak and the response and also 
two years ago, President Clinton met with Raul Castro here at the United Nations and shook hands with him and how happy he was to finally meet him. You're meeting the person, that was very hurtful for us as well. Meeting the, 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 the guy that gave the order to kill American citizens and you're very happy to hold his hand? Um, we are, it's one disappointment after another. My time's expired. I'll recognize the ranking member for his question. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, first of all, again, let me just express my sorrow at your loss. And uh, let me express my thanks to, to your sons and to the other uh, pilots uh, for their service to individual freedom and democracy. And in the case of your son, uh, Ms. Serasco, um, his service to the United States Marine Corps. Uh, Mr. Noriega and, and Dr. Leo Grande, you both, in your remarks, you talked about, uh, oh, Mr. Noriega, you talked about maintaining support for the Cuban dissidents and uh, funding for pro-democracy efforts, people-to-people uh, -people contact, Dr. Leo Grande, uh, similar sentiments as well uh, about engagement. Engagement. So the current policy really with President Trump is is really one of disengagement and, and more, more sanctions related. And I understand the thinking behind that, although there's a long history that says the sanctions are not, are not working. Uh, I've been to Cuba several times and uh, I have to agree with that sentiment. Um, how, how do we get there? How do we get to a point of holding uh, the Cuban leadership uh, accountable uh, through engagement? How, how does that work if this system of sanctions has not been successful these many years? Well, I think one of the points I wanted to make in my uh, statement, uh, Congressman, was that we've tried for 60 years uh, to treat the Cuban government as if it were a legitimate government. Uh, we've tried that and it's failed. Uh, I think we need to recognize that the purpose of uh, the United States is not to sell rice and soybeans. It was put on earth to promote uh, democracy, uh, human and protect human rights and promote these uh, shared values that make the world a better place. Um, engaging the totalitarian regime of, uh, of uh, Cuba to the exclusion of the 11 million people in Cuba, I think is a grotesque mistake. I think the idea that uh, people who are going to the uh, uh, beaches of Cuba to which Cuban people do not have access themselves to suntan themselves, and the idea that sunbathers are going to liberate Cuba is grotesque as well. The idea of American tourists doing pub crawls and rum tastings, tiptoeing through the tropical gulag in, in Havana, I think is grotesque as well. But it, I think it's a mistake to, for people to assert that we didn't have travel to Cuba. Hundreds of thousands of, Cu of American people uh, travel to Cuba uh, on a regular basis in different categories of travel. The best ambassadors for uh, the United States are Cuban Americans, who are also the people who heap uh, benefits, material benefits, on their family members uh, in Cuba. The United States uh, does some commerce uh, with Cuba, but the, it, we can't underestimate the importance of that personal contact of Cuban American family members. Uh, and I think that their wishes should have been respected by President Obama as he engaged uh, the regime that keeps those people enslaved. Let me ask, Dr. Leo Grande, uh, there's, a, there's a, a sense among some people that ironically the sanctions have actually helped sort of this, helped the regime by this rallying around the leaders there uh, against the, the big bad United States. Uh, any, what, what, what are your senses uh, as, as opposed to, you know, sanctions versus engagement? Well, I think there's no doubt that 
Cuban leadership has used the hostility of the United States to try to rally Cuban nationalism, right. wrap themselves in the Cuban flag. And I think, in, you know, they, they've got 50 years of experience doing that. They know how to do it. They're pretty good at it. I think in many ways, President Obama's policy of engagement was a more difficult one for them to actually deal with because the boogeyman was gone, as Roberta, Ambassador Roberta Jacobson said at one point. Um, the, they couldn't point to the United States as the source of all their problems anymore. Um, you know, with, with regard to uh, you know, engagement, I don't think it's really accurate that we spent 50 years treating the Cuban government like a legitimate government. For up until uh, most recently in 2014, uh, our attitude was, in fact, that Cuba was the Cuban government was illegitimate, and we we have we have the greatest sanctions still today against Cuba, greater than we have against any other country in the world. Uh, it is the policy of engagement that President Obama began, which began then to treat Cuba as a legitimate government, as at least a de facto government, in the same way that we treat lots of governments around the world that we don't like, uh, as the de facto government because it serves our national interest. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I, my time has expired. I yield back. The gentleman yields back. Uh, and Chair notes the presence of our colleague, who I did note for an opening statement, but I just want to ask officially unanimous consent that Ms. Ross Layton be allowed to fully participate in today's hearing. And without objection, it's so ordered. And I would now like to recognize her for five minutes. Well, thank you so much, uh, gentlemen, for your uh, gracious nature. I, I surely appreciate it because this, uh, this issue matters so much. Uh, to to me and to the constituents I, I represent. And there's no question that Castro ordered uh, his uh, Cuban Air Force to shoot down the two unarmed civilian aircraft, and they were identified as such, that killed Carlos, Mario, uh, Armando, and Pablo. Sadly, many of our allies around the world turned a blind eye uh, to that atrocious attack and continued to this day to turn a blind eye to the abysmal, abysmal uh, human rights record uh, uh, that are committed, the violations committed every day by the Castro regime in Cuba. And for too long, the wrongs committed upon American citizens have gone unpunished, uh, particularly in the case of the murders of, uh, of these four brave pilots. Um, the Cuban regime is known as you pointed out, Mr. Chairman, for harboring uh, U.S. fugitives of justice, including uh, William Morales, Joanne Chesimard, so many. Um, and the regime is also known for its coziness with other um, U.S.-designated foreign terrorist groups like Hezbollah and the FARC. The regime is responsible for destabilizing uh, the governments of other countries in the region, in Venezuela, in Nicaragua, in Ecuador, we have seen Castro's hand in weakening the democratic institutions uh, of those countries. And I would ask the, the experts here, under current U.S. law, what authorities or avenues are available for the families um, to sue or or for the U.S. government to bring to justice the, the individuals responsible for the shoot down and, and other many human rights violations. Also, are there any legal barriers or uh, restrictions that prevent this from happening um, that could be resolved by an act of Congress? Or is it that administrations have, have lacked the, the political will? What do we need to do? And finally, we've heard about, uh, we hear about the international mechanisms uh, to go after the regime, a, tri a tribunal set up by the UN Security Council, getting responsible nations to join us and holding the Cuban regime officials accountable for their human rights abuses. But how do we go about doing that if, if we agree that we should? Well, we know that Russia and China uh, will uh, block anything that we try to do uh, on Cuba at the Security Council. And when Sometimes even our allies who agree with us, as we saw with um, Ambassador Haley's statements on our withdrawal from the UN Human Rights Council yesterday, are unwilling to take that extra step and, and do the right thing. So what levers of persuasion 
um, or pressure can we use to get them on board? So the legal barriers, um, what legal avenues are available for redress, and what can we do internationally to get others to help us? Thank you, Madam Chairman. I think the first step we have to take is focus on the political will to get us there. And the legal mechanisms have existed. I think plenty of U.S. attorneys in your hometown have tried. I think what happens is that when the indictments reach Washington, something happens at the Department of State and at the Justice Department and at the White House potentially, and the whole thing is, as the families have, I mean, they'll share many stories with you over two decades worth of trying to do this. Something just happens, it comes to a halt. That's why I was recommending the first step, declassify everything we have, empower the U.S. attorneys to pursue this again. The red notices, frankly, can be issued tomorrow if they wanted to do it for some of the existing indictments. But also, I think the other part of this beyond political will, because that's an important part of any justice equation in cases like these, you have to enforce U.S. law. U.S. law is not an embargo. That's a big myth that there's a comprehensive embargo in place against Cuba. That's not existed since 1992. There are uh, difficulties in engaging in the Cuban marketplace, but it's not a comprehensive embargo. Uh, and because the law has never been enforced that way. And that gets to your question, and a lot of points have been raised here. The U.S. government has never tried to internationalize our strategy as required in statute to get our allies to cooperate with us. So it would be a, in the case of some of these indictments and the red notices, we could work with our colleagues in Latin America, Asia, Europe, folks that want to work with us to pursue maybe the Interpol notices, to cooperate with us to bring these people to justice, to freeze assets, to freeze bank accounts, to make it so that no international Cuban scoff law can travel, Cu leave Cuba. We can do that tomorrow. We just need Amen. the political will to make it so. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Poblet. Thank you so much, Mr. Chairman, for your generosity. No problem. Chair now recognizes the gentleman from Vermont for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, first of all, to moms who lost uh, your sons, I join all of us in uh, expressing my condolences to you and admire your perseverance on behalf of their memory and justice for them. So thank you. Uh, and Professor uh, Leo Grand, uh, just in your words, describe how engagement would be helpful uh, to young Cubans in, in an effort to modernize their political system. Well, the first thing it does, as we were speaking of earlier, is it, it takes away uh, the regime's ability to blame the United States for all of Cuba's problems. I think engagement, particularly uh, extended travel, and I, and I have to say that Americans are not lying on beaches thinking that that's going to liberate Cuba. The law still prohibits Americans, actually, from going to Cuba strictly for tourism. But engagement with Americans uh, has helped to build uh, a new private sector in Cuba. Uh, there are now over 500,000 private businesses, uh, not counting agricultural businesses. Has travel uh, gone down uh, since the change in administrations? It has. Travel uh, uh, is down this year, over last, about 40% from the United States. Oh. And I think that's primarily due to the travel warning that the State Department put in place when we had the ordered departure from, from the embassy. Uh, and that's, the ordered departure, of course, is required by law. Uh, so and it was not, not unreasonable to reduce the staffing of the embassy, uh, uh, given the apparent danger that U.S. diplomats were in. Yeah. But if that persists, then it... Uh, it, it does cast a shadow over our ability to have a more productive relationship uh, with Cuba. Um, you know, Cuba, young Cubans are, are hopeful of, uh, first of all, young Cubans, I should say, are much more critical of the Cuban regime than the older generation is. They're much less tolerant of its, uh, its lack of freedom, its lack of economic and political freedom. Um, but they have uh, generally been, as all Cubans have been, supportive of a policy of U.S. engagement. There are a couple of polls that have been done by people here in the United States, in Cuba, asking Cubans what they think about the policy of engagement, and thank they've you. supported it. All right. Thank you very much. Mr. Noriega, um, would you, you, you've been, there's human right issues, obviously, in, in, in Cuba, and uh, is it your, and I know you're passionate about that in Cuba, and thank you for that. But do you believe those human rights 
standards should apply to all countries, freedom of expression, free practice of religion, and the right to form political association. Excuse me. And do you? Do there, you is, there, yes, there are universally thanks. recognized human rights. I have no, would have no problem and, endorsing and, those. Right. So rights. I would take it you would believe the U.S. if it's going to be supportive of human rights in Cuba should be supportive of human rights everywhere. Of course. And there there are some contradictions. It appears to some outside observers. For example, last year, as you know, President Trump uh, was with King Solomon of Saudi Arabia. And there's an immense amount of evidence that there are serious uh, human rights abuses uh, in Saudi Arabia. And the president said, we're not here to lecture. We're not here to tell other people how to live, what to do, or how to worship. Uh, how does that square with our advocacy well, I, what we should I, be doing in Cuba? I'm happy to assure you, Congressman, I agree with you <laughs> that we should defend human rights everywhere. Well, thank you. Um, You're welcome. Professor Leah Grand, uh, can you think of a principled reason why the president would cut off relations with Cuba uh, for human rights reasons, but at the same time withhold any criticism of human rights abuses in Saudi Arabia? Well, you know, in in the history of American diplomacy, uh, the United States has has always supported human rights in principle, but in practical terms, we often balance our our support for human rights off against other interests that we may have, economic, strategic interests. Um, and I think that's, that's what we see in the president's policy, as I said earlier, toward North Korea or his, okay. his policy towards the Philippines and, just, and so on and so one forth. One last question. How are our farmers doing uh, under the uh, current policy towards Cuba? I'm sorry, how are? Our farmers, Midwest farmers doing? Well, um, so... Uh, right now, because our farmers can't get private financing, external financing for their sales to Cuba, and, ha and the Cubans have to pay cash up front, uh, we're not the most attractive customer for the Cuban government. We've nevertheless been able to maintain several uh, hundred million dollars of trade, but if that financing restriction were to be removed, uh, the Cuban market is a $2 billion agricultural imports market. Okay, thank you. My time has expired. I yield back. Gentleman yields back. Um, Chair now recognizes himself uh, for five minutes. Ambassador Noriega, when Obama o did his opening to Cuba, you had a lot of American corporations partnering and doing business with the Cuban military. And, um, you know, in the tourist industry in particular, where those industries traffic and stolen uh, property that was seized uh, from the regime. So this conflicts with the Helms-Burton law, which I know you are heavily involved with, to protect the rights of Americans whose property was stolen in Cuba, and the Trump policy prohibiting commerce with the military dictatorship. Um, but yet for decades, foreign companies have been trafficking in these stolen properties, and despite last year's reversal, American companies continue to do so as well. In your opinion, how should that problem be handled by the U.S. government? Well, I think it's more important than ever, particularly that some U.S. companies are engaging and there are some travel and carnival cruises and all these sorts of things going down and using facilities in Cuba. It's more important than ever that we apply the law uh, because there are Americans who are now essentially violating uh, the uh, concept of uh, property rights of fellow American citizens. Uh, and so there are a couple of provisions uh, that could be applied. Uh, Title IV of the uh, Libertad Act uh, uh, authorizes the Secretary of State to pull the visas of people who participate in, in that. And so there will be some American companies that have foreign, or work, or foreign uh, executives who, uh, who would poten potentially be impacted by that. And you have Title III, a right of action, simply says go to a court of law and say, uh, demonstrate that this is your property, that under the Libertad Act, this person was not authorized to use that property, uh, and uh, the person trafficking uh, in that stolen property would be accountable to the other American, uh, or for that matter, uh, foreign companies could also be accountable to Americans if the President of the United States decided to stop waiving uh, the right of people to bring uh, action under the Title III of the Libertad Act, which the President could do tomorrow if he wanted to. Mr. Poblet, do you agree? I think we have to find a way to bring Cuba to account on not only these claims, but claims 
of, 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 my, of the families. And the property issue, and this is odd coming from a lawyer, but the last thing some of us want to do is end up in court trying to litigate cases and spending te our, our clients' money on, on, on litigation, because litigation is expensive. But we need to use Title III, the threat of it. We need to use Title IV more robustly to bring Cuba to the negotiating table and stop hedging so much, uh, not just on the certified claims, but on these cases. And I think that's how we need to approach the Cuba uh, conundrum. I don't think it's that complicated. We have states in the union that have a lot more GDP than Cuba will ever generate. So I think it's, it's, it's a manageable issue, but I think right now what we really need is political will. I understand the arguments on both sides, uh, but the claimants have been waiting a very long time. Uh, if we keep uh, this curious ambivalence that's characterized U.S. policy for about 20 years, again, Republican and Democrats, who uh, administrations who haven't wanted to deal with this issue. But we must deal with this issue, primarily because American citizens are being hurt. Uh, secondly, American interests are being undermined. We're not the only ones trying to get into Cuba. The Russians are trying to get in there. China's trying to get into The Europeans are trying to compete with us in there. Uh, so I think a concerted effort where there's political will from the Trump administration, what the president laid out very clearly, he says, in economic practices that disproportionately benefit the Cuban government or its military intelligence agencies and what have you. I mean, it's a, it's a very broad approach where he's instructing the executive branch, this is where I want to go. And I think it's in the execution where the executive branch officials and his advisors need to follow through on. And I think we can get to an agreement, but we have to finally tackle it and be willing to not punt it. We'd love to have Title III, uh, but that's not the, I guess, economically uh, uh, optimal solution of this issue. We, we need a solution that we can negotiate directly, hopefully, with a future Cuban government. Ms. De La Pena, is there any doubt in your mind that Raul Castro is responsible uh, for the deaths? None whatsoever. I hold them accountable. Ms. Ciresco, any doubt? that Raul Castro is culpable? Not at all, and I encourage you to listen to the <coughs> transmission that um, from the radio interview that he gave. I have provided that in my documents. Well, I mean, you know, you see our government will indict like Martha Stewart for something. So why not indict Raul Castro for his role? These people just did not do this on their own. They were directed to do it uh, by the regime and by Raul Castro. and. Uh, I think that if the Trump administration would move forward with a, more, I mean, a series of indictments, but certainly that indictment, um, I think that that would send a very strong signal that, that this administration, like it sent signals in other parts of the world, that it does mean business, um, and it's going to take care of some of these issues that have been lingering for a long time. I was in Jerusalem when they moved the embassy. That had been going on for decades. Finally, we did it. Um, you see other parts of the world where there's this, this, uh, this, this movement. So uh, we need to bring an indictment against Raul Castro, and I hope they do that very quickly. Um, and I'm out of time. Uh, Steve, do you want to be recognized? Uh, no, I have no further questions. Illy? Thank you so much. Pete? All right. Well, I want to thank you guys for coming. Um, look, I know it's frustrating when you're talking about an issue that's lingered, um, but my view is, is that you just can't give up. And if there are ways where we in the Congress can be helpful to try to push forward with good policy, uh, whether it's accountability or whether it's um, applying the law more vigorously so that the American people's objectives are met, we've got to do that. And so, we did the Miami trip in January. That was illuminating. And then this, hopefully, will give us some momentum to go to the White House and say, now's the time. Let's take some action. With that, this hearing's adjourned. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. No? You, you brought Great job. <laughs> I mean, you brought other aspects too, like like the claims. You brought the aspect of the claims, you know, all the claims that have been lingering for 60 years. Yes. Ay, Ana, quiera Dios mío. Yeah. Well, then, you know, I can make you say, yeah, yeah, sir. Roger, Carol, Carol, Roger. Nice to meet you.
no sé qué no sé hablaste hablaste Gracias.